Have you ever found yourself frustrated with someone who was trying to help you? It could have been a spouse or a parent, a teacher or a mentor or a pastor. It could have been a coworker or a friend. But they saw something that needed to be addressed and they share their wisdom with you. And mama, it's not like they said it in a demeaning or demoralizing way, but you just did not want to hear it. Maybe you were just trying to ignore that stuff they wanted to talk about, hoping it would go away. Or maybe it touched an area of your life that you were proud of. And in your mind, you had it all together in this particular area. You knew what you was doing, but their comments reveal some stuff about you. Or just maybe it touched one of those sensitive areas. From a traditional standpoint, you've always believed in this. This is one of those core tenets that your parents taught you when you was a kid, and it has to be this way. But when they began to talk, Dre, it made you begin to question some stuff. It unearthed some stuff, and now you feel somewhat uneasy. And y'all know how we do when we feel threatened, we lash out at people. My brother-in-law would tell you, I'm going to put you in your place. I'm going to get you off of me. So we say stuff we have no business saying, or we shut people out, ghost them, won't talk to them, won't be bothered with them. Stop hanging out with them. Anybody been there? Y'all know what I'm talking about? Y'all been there? This is where I believe the Jews are right now. You see, Paul has punched some holes in their traditions, in their core tenets about what they believe. He started talking about them when it comes to the law and told them that in and of itself, the law cannot save them. That in and of itself, the law reveals things, but it's not going to save you. He told them about their precious circumcision, that circumcision without the law is powerless because it's not the physical circumcision that each and every one of us needs but it is the spiritual circumcision that we need it's the circumcision of our hearts so when they hear this they're getting a little warm with paul and paul senses that and he anticipates that some of them may be ready to turn him off. Remember who he is. This is the great apostle Paul. And as we studied in the book of Acts, he's traveled throughout Asia and throughout Europe preaching the good news. And every city that he went to, Miss Eleanor, he got pushed back. They, 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 they had questions. Now Paul anticipates their questions and begins to address some of them right now. And he's going to pose three objections. Look at objection number one. Romans, third chapter, verse number one. Look at what it says. Then what advantage does the Jew have? Or what is the benefit of circumcision? 
what advantage does the Jew have or what is the benefit of circumcision? What's the purpose of me being a Jew? If me being a Jew does not separate me from the Gentile, why give me this law if me having this law does not make me any better or any more special than anyone else? Why have me get circumcised if the circumcision does not make me any better than that guy I've been looking down upon my entire life. Why am I going through all of this stuff? Why am I making all of these various different sacrifices when I'm just like everybody else? From a New Testament standpoint, some of us may say, why do I keep going to church? If church does not save me. Why do I keep paying my tithes if I'm still going to have financial problems? If giving does not secure me from financial hardship, why do I keep on giving? I can do a lot of stuff with that money. There's some bills I can put away, I can pay. There's some savings I can do. So why do I keep doing all this stuff? If it's not going to make me any difference, why be a Christian if I'm going to keep going through trial after trial after trial after trial? Why do I attach myself to a God who says he can heal when my body can still be racked in pain, when I can still find myself with some terminal disease, and then even though I pray, I can still die? Why? I go through all of that. And if the truth be told, many of us have been going through some stuff. The moment we gave our life to Christ, we have found ourselves struggling over and over and over again. And the deeper we try to go in Christ, the more committed we are, the more we pray, the more we fast, the more we meditate, the more we serve, the more we give, the more it seems like trials and tribulations keep knocking on our door. I listen to that preacher and I've been praying and doing all that stuff. And every time it seems like I get more connected to my God, here comes another trial. Here comes another issue. Here comes another tribulation. Here comes something else. And I'm just tired of all this something else. So, Miss Eleanor, we just want to say I'm done with this stuff. I was doing better with how we're just running the streets. Doing my own thing. <laughs> I wasn't worried about any of that stuff then. I, I could just do what I want. I didn't have that spiritual conscience then. I might well just go back to doing what I was doing. But here's the thing. Here's the thing, my friend. Would you get this? Our walk with the Lord is not transactional. Let me say that again. Our walk with the Lord, our relationship with the Lord is not transactional. We are not in this for the benefits. We are not walking with the Lord so that we can get some tools that's going to allow us to live our best life now. It's not about, let me walk with Christ so I can get some more money in my bank account. It's not, let me walk with Christ so I can post some stuff that's going to get me some more followers. But it is a relationship. And for many of us, 
our relationship is upside down. It's extremely erratic, inside out, because we are in it for the benefits. And when things are going well, our walk with him in our mind is well. And we are happy and we are excited and we got hallelujahs going up and we are praising him and giving him glory. But when the blessings slow down or even come to a stop, we find ourselves in this valley and we're wondering where is God? Does he still love me? Why has he stepped onto my scene? Does he have the real power to take care of this? Does he really answer prayer? And our relationship is built on what we can get, not on who he is. Think about it like this. There's a guy who used to travel a lot. And every time he would go out of town, his son would get upset. Because he was missing his dad. He just could not understand why his dad would leave for three, four, five days at a time. So when his dad would come back, he would try to explain to his son where he has been and what he has been doing. But the child was too young to understand. So what he started doing, Brian, he would bring him back a gift. And then he would utilize that gift as an object lesson to explain where he has been and what he has done. So one day he gets home. And as he walks through the door, his son is super excited to see him, runs up to him and starts looking. Where's the gift? And when he doesn't see the gift, he runs over to his dad's bags, opens up the bags. Maybe the gift is inside of there. No gift. So Daniel, he goes back to his room, with tears running down his face because he did not give him a gift. But he didn't stop and hug his dad first. He didn't stop and take time to hang out and play their favorite game together. He just went back to his room. You see, the father's return from home, from, from, from his visits, had become transactional. It was all about what was daddy going to bring me today. Not my dad has returned and I'm excited to see my dad and I want to hug my dad and I want to hang out with my dad. But it was about what is dad going to bring me this time. Let's not allow our relationship with the Lord to be transactional. He's too good for that. Just think about who he is. He's the creator of the universe. He spoke the world into existence. He's El Shaddai, the almighty God, the magnificent one, the marvelous one, the one who can do anything but fail and he loves you and I so Jasmine let's not mess up our relationship with the Lord by making it purely about what he can do for me Let's allow our relationship with the Lord to go deeper than that. To be about who he is 
and his greatness and his magnificence and what he has already done. He's already said, I love you by sending his son. And that son says, I love you too by dying on the cross. So what more does he need to do to demonstrate his love? And if he does not do anything else, he's done enough with that. But in all of that stuff that he has done, he continues to bless you and I beyond measure. So, Jay, what if he doesn't bless us again? Does that mean that we have no value in his eyes? And that's the thing. Our value is not determined by his blessings. He loves us just for us. That's what I have to believe Paul is trying to tell them. Go back to your text. Romans, the third chapter, verse number one. Then what advantage does the Jew have? Or what is the benefit of circumcision? Great in every respect. First, that they were entrusted with the actual words of God. Paul is like, the Lord saw enough in these Jews to bless them with his oracles, with his word. And just because it did not lead to salvation for all of them, does not mean that it did not have value. For the word was the means of leading them unto a righteous relationship with him, showing them how to live in harmony with one another. The thing is that that word said, I value you. Because out of all the people groups on the face of the earth, he chose the Jews. He says, I'm giving my word to you. I could have chose the Babylonians. I could have chose the Assyrians. I could have chose anybody else on the face of the earth. But God says, I chose you to be my special people with my word. And he gave it to them. And God sees something special in you. Justice, you hear me? God sees something special in you. There's greatness in you. You may not see it sometimes, but God sees something special in you. And he's demonstrated how special each and every one of us is by sending that son once again to pay the price for our sins. If you're not special, he doesn't do that. And the fact that he thinks that we are special is not dependent upon what he gives us. But it's dependent upon the fact that he created us to be special. If he doesn't answer your prayer, that is not an indictment on who you are in his eyes. Let that marinate there for a second. I pray Monday. I pray Tuesday. I pray Wednesday. I pray Thursday. I pray Friday. I pray last month. I pray six months before that. And God still did not answer my prayer. What's wrong with me? Nothing. Because the answer to your prayers is not an indictment on how special you are in him. 
There's too many other factors involved. But who you are and what he has for you is not determined by his answering of your prayer. You are special because he created you to be special. Perfect? No. Have some room to grow? Yes. But you are still special in God's eyes. And that's what Paul is trying to get them to see and trying to get us to see. We are special. So stop allowing the relationship to be transactional and defining who we are in him by what he has done for us. You are special, period. So let's walk in that with our heads high. Objection number two. Thank you, Nehemiah. Just because some chose not to believe, does that mean that God is unfaithful? Look at your text. Go back to verse number three. What then? If some did not believe, their unbelief will not nullify the faithfulness of God, will it? Paul is saying, just because some of the Jews chose not to believe in him does not mean his plan for salvation was wrong. Nor does it mean that he was unfaithful. Just because some Jews got the purpose of circumcision all mixed up and they started to make circumcision or the sign of the covenant, the actual covenant itself, does that mean that God's original plan failed? All my parents, all my parents, think about this. We're going to create this fictional family. We're going to call them the Smiths. Mama and Daddy Smith bear three children. And they raised them all up in a loving home, provide them with a good education, teach them the ways of the Lord, make sure they have everything they need to be successful in life, to include when they needed it, punish them. Two of the children grow up, take all of that stuff that they had learned, apply it, and they become positive, productive members of society, raise kids of their own and raise their kids in a loving family. But one child chose not to do that. And that particular child gets all mixed up in some mess they had no business doing, gets caught up in the law. So now does that mean that the parents were unfaithful to that one child? Because that one child made a choice to do something differently? No. Because that's the key, Miss Eleanor. It's a choice. You and I have been given choices to make. We choose to walk with Christ. Nobody makes us walk with Christ. We choose to obey his law. We choose to surrender our will to his will. We choose to allow the Holy Spirit to come on the inside of us and for it to begin to circumcise our hearts. Those are choices that we make. But if we choose not to do that, that does not make God unfaithful. God is still God whether we make the choice or not. He's still king whether we make the choice or not. He's still Lord. He's still master. Whether we make the choice or not, it's up to us what we're going to do. It's up to us to put our trust in him and allow him to lead us and to take us to where he would have us to go. But he's not unfaithful if we choose not to walk with him. 
Objection number three. Why am I being punished for making God look good? So here's the question they're wrestling with. Like, okay, you tell me that this law has been given as my schoolmaster. You tell me that this law has been given unto me for the purpose of leading me unto a righteous relationship with the Lord. You tell me that the more hours I sin, the more God is glorified because my God is glorified in my unrighteousness because my sins reveal how good he is and my need for a savior. So then why in the world punish me for helping God out? Right? Why am I getting punished? Why has he removed his hands from me and let me just do what I want to do? No one's going to lead me to destruction. Why am I going to face a wrath to come? If I'm helping him out. Why not just let me keep sinning over and over and over again, knowing that my sins are going to make him look good? But what they don't understand is that sin destroys. It destroys us individually. It destroys our relationships with one another. And it destroys our relationship with God. Tackle them one by one. It destroys us individually. There's something only inside of us. Something innately in us that knows that there's a difference between right and wrong. And there's something on the inside of us that begins to turn and churn and get upset as we keep doing stuff over and over and over again that we have no business doing. We know the way we're living is not right. And it's irritating us and it's agitating us. And there's something on the inside of us that says stop, but we keep doing it over and over and over again. No remorse, no repentance. We can say, I'm going to do me, and I'm going to do it, and I don't care. But when we're at home, and nobody's watching, and we're by ourselves, we have to deal with ourselves, it begins to eat at us mentally and emotionally. My life is not together. And I know I need to get my life together. And I know I need to make some changes. That's that sin beginning to eat away at us. But it begins to eat away at our relationships. That the more we sin, the more it affects those who are connected to us. Nobody sins in the bubble. But your actions have an effect on those connected to you. You may not have even intended to do something to them. But your sin is causing problems in that relationship. Just think about the married couple. Why in the world does that couple that was so in love with each other at the beginning couldn't breathe without each other? Stayed on the phone all night long. Couldn't think without each other. Couldn't go anywhere without each other. Y'all remember what I'm talking about? You know what I'm talking about, girl. What happened to now when you look at them, every time they turn around, they're fussing and fighting? It's the sin. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And our sins, when we bring them into a relationship, come with us. We talk about baggage and bringing baggage into relationships, but we forget that the greatest baggage that we bring into the relationship is our sin, our lies, 
our fornication, our craziness, our pornography habits, all that mess, we bring that into the relationship with us. And as we bring it into the relationship with us, it causes problems in the individual relationship. Number three, it causes problems in our relationship with God. God is holy, and he desires to be in relationship with you. He desires to commune with you in the middle of the day. But here's the thing. His holiness does not deal with our unholiness. And the more we sin, the more we push him away. There's this divide, this wedge that's between us and him. And he's like, I want you to come unto me, all you who labor in a heavy lace. I want you to knock on the door. I want to open up the door. But there's this sin in the way. And until we deal with the sin, the relationship that we want to have with the Lord, we, we're unable to have it. So Paul says, you really don't understand what you're saying. By just continuing to sin over and over and over again without any regard. He says, they'll be condemned. You, you'll just be by yourself, disconnected. Judgment's coming upon you. I don't know about you, but that's not what I want. I want to be in a relationship with the God who created me. I believe that there's something on the inside of me that's screaming and yelling and hollering for a relationship and for a connection to him. Something that I can't feel with stuff. And if I share my testimony with you, I've tried it. I've tried to fill that hole with alcohol. It didn't work. With the opinion of other people, it did not work. With girls, it did not work. I tried to fill that hole with all other kinds of stuff, but none of that stuff was able to fill the hole, the throne of which my God was supposed to sit on. It was only in a relationship with him that I began to understand who I am and why I have been created. And what makes me special and why I am valuable. It was only in that relationship with him. And that became the motivating factor for me starting to address some of my sins. Not because he was going to put more money in my pocket. But I began to learn about who he is and what he did for me. Oh, let me start making some adjustments. Or as Paul is trying to teach us in these first three chapters of Romans, I am a sinner in much need of a savior. And I want to be connected to that savior. I want to make sure I'm walking with him. I have a relationship with him that extends beyond the transactional. And it's about him and who he is. And I'm not up because he blessed me, but I'm up and I'm high because of who he is. And I'm not sitting in the valley whining because my blessing has not shown up, but my God is still good. So I'm just going to walk with him. Who as the song says, I'm going to run on and see what the end is going to be. I can't figure it all out, but I think that some of you are just like me. We're going to run on to see what the end is going to be. Mm -hmm. And whether he does anything else, he is still God. He's still master. He's still king. And the more I walk with him, the more we understand 
that he's good. The deeper our relationship with him gets, the more we understand he's worthy of praise. He's worthy of sacrifice. He's worthy of me surrendering. Get this. He's worthy of me surrendering my will to his will. That's it. For me letting go. And I don't know about you, but that was the hardest thing for me to do. And it still becomes hard. To let go and let God. Romans is about the gospel. But one of the underlying stories here is about the work of the Holy Spirit. I'll be as Paul penned this letter. The Holy Spirit was not only speaking to the Jewish audience, but it was speaking to you and I. Read it. The Spirit wants to work on the inside of you. It's not by our will or our might that we're going to be able to do what God is asking us to do. But it's by his spirit. That's where the change is going to come. Been there, done that, tried to will my way into a good relationship with the Lord. It don't work. It's like bumping your head up against a brick wall. But when you let the Holy Spirit do what the Holy Spirit wants to do, I fail many a times, many a times, trying to do it by myself, trying to work my way into a great relationship with him. But the more I learn to let go and let God's spirit have his way, the more depth my relationship has with him, the greater my walk is with him, the more meaning in my relationship with him.